right, I think that we should um, kick this uh, webinar off. Um, good day, everyone, and thank you for joining um, today's offline webinar. Um, I'm Tammy Pisani, the uh, offline membership manager for Queensland, and it is my pleasure to be hosting today's uh, webinar. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar um, from the lands of the Yagara and Turbal people, and that I also acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we all are meeting today. Um, for this webinar, I am joined um, by Accenture's Aldo Souza, Strategy Managing Director. Um, Aldo will be sharing his insights with us today on the critical role technology and strategy play in effective capital project management. Um, a bit about Aldo before we um, get started. Um, Aldo specializes in enterprise strategy, transformation, programs, M&A, and capital projects while also being an integral part of Accenture's um, global mining community. Uh, before joining Accenture, Aldo held the position of Executive Director at Anglo-American, where he spent a decade leading various corporate and, and technical functions, including capital projects, HSE, social performance, technical development services, and engineering. Um, Aldo obtained his mining engineering degree from the University of Sao Paulo and an MBA uh, from the Kellogg uh, School of Management in Chicago. Go Cubs. Um, he also holds uh, several certifications and postgraduate courses in leadership, general management, board management, mining, and technology from several institutions in various countries. Um, during today's webinar, Aldo will be covering um, topics such as improving capital efficiency and risk profile, project development optionality supported by digital technology, schedule optimization and reduce time to market and improve project safety and worker experience. Um, following Aldo's presentation, there will be time for a Q&A, so please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the presentation. And then at its conclusion, um, Aldo will um, answer some of uh, the audience's questions. So without further ado, um, Aldo, I give you the audience. Thank you so much, uh, Tammy. It's really a pleasure to be joining Ostmine in this uh, webinar. Uh, it's great to have Ostmine helping us to foster the industry in Australia, such an important industry, not only for the country, but also for the world. And it's really a pleasure to be here today to have a conversation about capital projects in our very intensive capital uh, intensive industry. So, uh, we will talk a little bit about the approach for strategic planning and, 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 and corporate strategy with regards to capital projects, but also the role of technology, right? And, and as it has been changing so fast and so many new uh, levers we can uh, use to develop capital projects, I think it's of an increasingly important uh, role for, for us to deploy capital in the industry, right? So thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, tell me, I will skip this one, but happy to connect offline to all the audience members that uh, would like to engage. Uh, I can be easily be I can be easily found in LinkedIn, so it will be a it will be a pleasure uh, to connect uh, and and further discuss this topic, which is very dear to me. Uh, so let's start a little bit uh, with the moment we are right, and uh, for some minerals. Uh, what it's called critical minerals, we have an unprecedented moment, right? We had the, 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 the commodities boom in, in the early 2000s at, that uh, applied mostly uh, to bulk minerals and a few of, the, uh, of the, the metals. But now we have the energy transition fostering uh, demand uh, with large commitments from different uh, constituents of, of of the society, that being countries, companies, uh, individuals, right? And that has an implication of massive transformation of the demand for those minerals uh, globally, right? So we've been seeing around 80 to $100 billion of capital being deployed in the mining industry globally every year, right? And we'll see some of these numbers. And that has a massive implication how companies and projects are developing and how companies develop and manage their project portfolio, right? And of course, it impacts all the entire associated industry, industries that Ausmine represents so well. 
so in terms of the data, let's see what is the latest uh, play we have seen in terms of numbers, right? And, and one of the aspects we're gonna be exploring here is the cyclicality of the, indus of the industry, right? And that's something that it's, is the first point I would like to approach with regards to um, the, the being strategic, right? Uh, how to navigate the cycle and use that in favor of developing uh, projects, right? Being those stay in business, being those brownfield expansions or new developments, right? So what is the data telling us? And then the first uh, piece I bring, I bring here is, 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 is the overall number of capital deployment in the industry over the last 16 years, right? Or, or, or for a period of 16 years, right? And what we, the first thing that stands out is the cyclicality, right? So we have this peak that occurred af after the global financial crisis, right? And then we had the commodity price, the commodity price crunch in 2016, uh, 2015 as well. And you can see how much that affects uh, the, the project development, right? Um, and, and, and the same is, is going on at the moment, right? We are in a downward trend since the monetary uh, expansion that occurred uh, during COVID, right? So we see more and more uh, the volumes of investment decreasing. And of course, different commodities, they have different partners, right? So I don't know, uh, is being somewhat flat in, 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 in um, uh, nominal terms. Uh, we see a lot of investment in copper steel because there has been a structural deficit uh, in terms of supply for that commodity over the last two or three decades at least. Uh, gold is being always uh, very strong, particularly in some jurisdictions, but all the, the commodities, they suffer with the cycle of the industry, right? So that's something that is any, any project development should be always aware of, right? As the, the, the development cycle is long, it will be hit by, by different moments throughout the cycle, right? So the second aspect here that I want to highlight is how that is split between staying business and sustaining uh, and, and new capital development, right? Being that brownfield or, or greenfield expansion, right? And, and we seen both decreasing, but mostly new projects, right? So there is a still a significant portion of uh, sustaining capital that's, that's being applied and that's in the majority of that. Uh, but the number, the, um, the amount of money to be spent in, in new expansions or in new projects is significantly uh, decreasing over the years. And by 26, um, it's, it's going to be almost half of what we have today. So it's a, it's a big drop, right? Um, gold, iron ore, and copper are the ones that lead the pack in terms of uh, sustaining business is the large asset base as well uh, in the mining industry, right? Uh, and in terms of new projects, copper is leading is leading the way, uh, mostly because of the the uh, the deficit that we 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 discussed it before. Um, and in terms of uh, exploration uh, and pipeline, this is a very interesting uh, uh, chart from uh, Standard Poor's, where where they have that uh, what they call the PIA, the Pipeline Activity Index that pulls together different aspects of the, of the capital project portfolio across the industry. That includes uh, exploration, drilling, um, projects moving stage gates, uh, announcements of, of new developments by industry players, et cetera, right? And what we can see here in, in, in the last two years, right? Uh, is this, this number is somewhat flat, right? We haven't seen this, um, uh, this growing in terms of exploration, but the pipeline itself is decreasing, right? So that means, and we will see in the next slide, that fewer and fewer projects are in the portfolio. So those that survive, there is lot much more scrutiny into those, right? And 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 players into into the capital project space have to do much a larger effort compared to twenty years ago to move these projects down the road, right? And then we're going to be exploring how we can play smartly. In, in, in navigating the, these projects through the development cycle. Um, and, and we see here that there, there is somehow a correlation between the size of the industry and, 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 and exploration and the pipeline index as well. 
So as I mentioned, uh, in the same period, these two years, we see more and more uh, the, the size of the portfolio being represented by, pro, uh, by projects that are in the later stage, construction and, 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 and commissioning, right? So you see in the uh, brown uh, chunk of the bars that those are the majority uh, of projects at the portfolio nowadays. And, and we see that just a few projects are in the pre-feasibility. Some, sometimes you don't see projects moving to pre-feasibility and it's not that different in terms of projects in the feasibility stage as well. So over these uh, last year and 22, we've seen a significant decrease in terms of projects moving uh, through through the gates um, for the mining industry. And that's uh, there, there are many uh, influences into that, of course, Price forecast is is a critical component, but also uh, uh, other uncertainties as well. And and we will talk a bit more about that. But geopolitical risk uh, maybe is the one that has grown the most over the last decade, right? And that has brought lots of uncertainty, not not only in terms of macroeconomic uncertainties, but also uh, country risk and 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 geographical risk, right? Uh, so. In terms of setting up projects for success, giving that environment, right? What we should be talking and what we should be uh, reinforcing in terms of practices so that these projects that remain in the portfolio are successful, right? And, and, and maybe just recapping, right? Things that we hear very commonly with regards to projects is the delaying permits and other approvals Environmental uh, uh, permitting is an issue for the industry globally. And we see some, of course, some jurisdictions uh, more sensible than others. But across the pack, uh, we see that as uh, the top five uh, items in the risk register of any, any project, right? Also, we see more complex ore body. So geological uh, risk is something that uh, we've been seeing as well. And even during projects that are being commissioned and struggling to ramp up, geological and geotechnical uncertainty has, has been a, a factor for those projects to achieve uh, nameplate and, and to fulfill the value creation that they were intended to. Uh, of course, social license and other environmental uh, pressures as well. Uh, uh, there is an increasingly uh, difficult uh, perception of society about mining. Of course, the recent disasters we have seen across the industry, uh, including tailings management, for instance, and heritage, heritage sites uh, don't have, uh, do not help uh, the industry. And the industry is putting forward lots of standards. We've seen ICMM doing lots of effort in that sense to elevate the level of practice, but definitely the relationship with the larger society and the, the in general, the societal acceptance of mining is something that creates uh, uh, difficulties to develop new projects or expand existing operations, right? And of course, supply chains, right? Project growth complexity or uh, uh, labor um, and, um, uh, equipment, etc. They they all have some inherent risk as well. So how do we we leverage the rate of technology change to the to favor the capital uh, life cycle? It's something we want to discuss. Yeah. And and one of the things we heard a lot, particularly in the last decade, is what would be the mining of the future, right? And 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 in Accenture we try to to tweak a little bit this to what is a future ready mine, right? And that's embed, that embeds the the rate of change we've seen in technology, right? So how do you over decades that a, a mining operation will will be up? How do you make uh, it for uh, ready for success and be able to adopt new technologies that at the moment you are doing the scoping or the conceptual study? these technologies are not available. Sometimes they are bare, barely uh, envisioned, right? And so how we move from that mind of the future as a uh, uh, something that's not uh, ready to change is just a vision versus something that will create optionality over the life cycle of the endowment. And, and, and then we see a few steps, right? Uh, and that's applicable not only to the mining industry, but all those industries that are capital intensive. 
The first thing is thinking big, right? How do you create as you start scoping and, and, and creating the options for, yeah, to, for a project, how do you envision uh, ways of operation and technology that's not the technology today, but is the technology that's going to be available 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, when that operation is going to be up, right? As we know, uh, the, the permitting, the land access, the construction, all that takes time, right? So how do we think big and be bold in regards to how we want to set up that, that, uh, that site. But at the same time, we need to, to start more, small, right? Uh, if, you, if we want to tackle too much at the same time, we will uh, obviously be bringing a significant uh, large portion of risk to the project. So doing something at the, at the uh, small scale and then scaling it uh, is the way to go. And we've seen that a lot not only in terms of technology adoption, but also engineering, right? And how we, for instance, discuss new flow sheets, new technologies that individually at the operating unit level, it works, but how do you pull them together? But you do that in a scalable way. So scale fast, once you have proven your concept is, is something that is really important, right? And, uh, and uh, the, the, you adopting new technologies is, is not different. So, uh, So the pilots uh, that I was mentioning, right? Uh, we need to be very specific on what we want to pilot. What are those critical components of any project that we want to adopt technology to a different stage that is today adopted in the market and be very specific in terms of the terms of reference, what wants to be achieved, what trans transformation wants to be done. And then how are you measured that? Um, you gotta be sure that you're gonna get something wrong, right? Across a portfolio of pilots, something will not work. And that's okay, that's, that's part of the game. But as, as the larger portfolio progresses and you, you, you will be able to be successful in some of the, uh, the pilots, that's, that's success in general for the, the project. And then all of those pilots that work it, how do you choose those that will really make a difference based on the results you got, right? So having, uh, uh, um, having clarity about what is to be achieved, understand how it's measured so uh, there is a single source of truth in terms of success, and then choosing then those, those pilots that work it well and push them forward, it's, it's something that's critical. And here we have some, some examples of what we've been doing with clients with regards to capital projects and adoption of technology. So generative design, for instance, and automation, right? So bringing the right data at the very beginning of the project is something that is critical, right? And that creates optionality, that brings agility to the teams, and that helps the business to create scenarios where it will be able to have more options to decide upon. And remembering on that cyclicality that we mentioned that is intrinsic to the industry, having more scenarios and having better agility to discuss the scenarios and execute them is critical to navigate the, side, the, the cycle, right? And there are other examples as well. So predictive analytics, how you work with analytics to better manage your schedule, to have more accuracy on your risk uh, profile your execution risk or your, on your mobilization risk, on your supply risk, et cetera. Connected worker, right? Labor is critical in many capital projects, right? How many people you have? What level of training and upskilling you need for that? Uh, safety, for instance, what are the leading indicators that can prevent you to get incidents occurring, potential, potential, uh, particularly high potential incidents. How do you use data to be more efficient with regards to safety, right? This is, this is uh, all technology that is available in many different industries and can and has been applied to, to mining and capital projects, right? Particularly in those jurisdictions, as I mentioned, where labor is critical, very expensive and difficult to access. And then there are other uh, uh, things as well, uh, uh, use of imagery to uh, real-time progress uh, monitoring, uh, connected construction, setting up the infrastructure right at the beginning that later on can be leveraged also during operations and etc. 
Uh, in terms of scaling, uh, we already uh, discussed a little bit, but I would like to reinforce uh, uh, three aspects of that. The one is once a, a pilot is, is proved, how do you mature that? How do you go deep? Bring other people to really stress test that, uh, that case, right? So that you decrease at the very beginning the level of risk that could occur uh, uh, and you could incur later on as you're going to go broader and scale that. And then once you stress test that, uh, how do you use that into your, your, your broader project, right? And how do you communicate and increase level of adoption uh, and, and have people adopting that pilot and, and getting aware of it, right? And then finally, use that whenever applicable across the portfolio, right? All the big major miners, they have many, many projects, right? And the level of commonality that could be used, particularly with regards to adoption of technologies is, is massive, right? However, we know project teams sometimes tend to be siloed, right? So sometimes we, we see uh, people lacking that opportunity of sharing those practices and solutions, particularly with technology that can be readily used. Uh, and here, um, again, uh, talking a little bit about uh, cyclicality and how we can um, decrease the projects down the road. We see in this chart what typically happens uh, in projects in project and what normally lead uh, projects to go over budget and, and, and also delayed, right, in terms of, of time, right? So the, the main point here is that over time, as you move through the, 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 the project development cycle, from scoping, pre-feasibility, feasibility, et cetera, final investment decision to construction and commissioning, your ability to change decreases significantly. Right? This is very known, right? And the same, the cost will increase, right? You already took decisions, you involve with partners, at certain points, you involve your suppliers, you start with your critical lead time, long lead time items, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you need to go back and change something, it's going to be very costly, right? So, and, and unfortunately, between uh, after the options are narrowed in your feasibility study or pre feasibility to feasibility study, and before you start construction or while you're starting construction, you start to see some requirements for change. And that's where most of that we've seen occur. And it's already uh, late in the sense that it not only is, is more costly, but also may cascade into changes down the road of construction that will be even more expensive, right? So the main point here is that you want to do that before. You want to shift that amount of change to the earlier stages, right? So you invest more, iterate more early and leverage technology for that in terms of design, in terms of location, in terms of footprint, in terms of permitting, environment impact, et cetera, et cetera. All the disciplines that are critical to the project development so that uh, you can test those, right? And leverage technology for that. And later on, you have a, a higher certainty of development and then an, a decreased amount of cost whenever you have to, uh, to do changes that uh, are remained left, right? And once you have those changes uh, described in these early, uh, delineated in these earlier stages, you're, you are able to do that with more agility, right? Whereas when, when, once you are stuck with uh, construction and all the partners, the amount of people you're already bringing on down the road, it's going to be much harder, right? So doing that in the, the pre-fees uh, stages, the scoping, all the planning and, and creating the optionals during the design phase is where we should iterate more. And, and with the technology, some of that I mentioned, in terms of, of design, in terms of digital twins, in terms of having the right data, being that on the mineral side or the engineering side, is something the mineral processing side or the engineering construction side is, is the better the better time to iterate with those with those data. So and, and then there is another aspect of of project development here that I wanted to highlight, which is the, the sustainability component, right? That being uh, carbon uh, reduction or the larger climate change efforts and also the broader sustainability agenda, including socioeconomic development, uh, biodiversity, biodiversity stewardship, 
um, and community relations, et cetera, right? So the, the overall growth of requirements for a sustainable capital project development is massive, right? Well, as soon as last week, we were discussing with a client that is deploying uh, $10 billion of project each year in the near future, how we can do smarter engineering with regards to sustainability, how we can uh, involve environmental permitting, community relations, uh, heritage site management, uh, traditional owners relationships, how we can bring all of those items into the scoping, into the pre-feasibility study of a project so that you can iterate with those variables early in, in the process, right? Uh, instead of having surprises um, as you start construction. So that's a, a reality, right? And, and all the major miners, including ICMM members, they have commitments with regards to ESG, with regards to climate change, to carbon neutrality. And we highlighted here a few of the, um, of the sustainable development goals, but they are not only those, right? There are others as well that are impacted by, by project construction and project development. So how factoring the sustainability agenda in the project development is critical and is, is increasingly become more and more critical and demanded by uh, all the developers. So in terms of practices, what we've been seeing in terms of the adoption of technology uh, for those that have done well, for those that uh, players that have developed uh, project successfully, they are getting good surprise once they commission the project, once they ramp up towards nameplate, etc. First thing is being serious, serious about digital, right? Digital is here to help, is here to uh, provide more and more tools to those thinking about the options that we can have available to make a project uh, uh, viable and then its development successful, right? So senior leadership understanding that data is critical, that digital can be of help is important, right? That from the owner's side, but also from the EPCs as well and all the entire value chain of, of, uh, of supplier, right? And, and we've been seeing very interesting examples, not only in mining, but for instance, in uh, utilities, right? Transmission lines, right? Uh, running and development um, a line and, and accessing land has been really transformative in terms of using a, a satellite imagery, uh, drone imagery, uh, remote sensing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just to name to name one example, right? Data sharing infrastructure. This is something very new as well, and is in some areas is where uh, developers are thinking outside of the box. For instance, environmental permitting. How you can create terms of reference and standards to share your data in a digital form with the environmental regulators, right? Saving thousands and thousands of pages of reports that need to be shared and uh, submitted uh, to environmental regulators. How do you create standards with the authorities so that your database can be shared online with those authorities? We've been working with clients in that sense and they have used, for instance, uh, neural processing language for analyzing old documentation on fauna and flora in water studies, et cetera. And that has free up, uh, freed up time for both environmental analysts in, in the developer uh, team, but also in the environmental authority so they can discuss what is really meaningful to approve that project and to grant the permits, right? Just another example, right? Uh, Value creation, right? So creating optionality early in this space. How do you navigate through the cycle? How do you have alternative flow sheets, alternative engineering designs, alternative land access requirements, using data and digital twins to create those options so that you can uh, stress uh, your, your value of that project, your, your capital requirements, and then uh, that may even... Uh, mean the, the life or death or of a project, right? Uh, organizational agility as well. So testing early those scenarios uh, will have your team uh, better to react down the road, right? So uh, having an operator model that embrace the improvement opportunities uh, and uh, have those listed and ready to go 
is something that's critical in, uh, for, for us. And finally, the human aspect, right? There's no point in bringing and fostering lots of technology adoption and, and, and investment in terms of data and digital capabilities if you're not concerned about uh, uh, user uh, uh, adoption and, and uh, user interface, right? And we know in engineering in particular, there is an intergenerational issue, right? Sometimes the experience factor is critical, right? People who have done projects over decades, who have experienced issues in the past, do, who have the ability, who has the ability to uh, contribute with their past experience, but sometimes are not the ones that will adopt new technologies uh, in the fastest way. So how do you mitigate that with better user experience, right? And, and making technology easier to be adopted, right? And also bringing people up to, to date in terms of upskilling and, and training, right? And we're, for instance, in the uh, generative AI, we're just in the beginning and the amount of money companies are investing in training their, their users on how they can do similar tasks differently is just massive. And, and that's, that's just the beginning. So these are factors that we've been seeing uh, as common in, in projects uh, that have been successful in terms of technology adoption and using that for higher, higher chances of uh, progressing their projects. Uh, and in terms of Accenture, we have our model, uh, what we call strategic and operating tech, uh, network, uh, Capstone. Accenture has a global uh, capital projects team uh, we've been doing not only organic growth, but also acquiring different companies. Here uh, in, in Australia, we've been acquiring uh, companies that play in the rail space and mining space, uh, both from an uh, engineering uh, aspect, but also automation as well. And, and, and Capstone has basically uh, uh, four components, right? And, and, and the one is a, a data committed C-suite, right? It is important to convince and get that sponsorship, sponsorship from the top, right? Uh, otherwise, uh, things will, will fade out down the road. Uh, second is creating the right infrastructure so that the, the engineering teams, the project teams, the, the vendors, the EPCs, they can all, all drink from that, uh, that same source in an organized and structured way, right? Talent is as critical as well. So that being new talent and emerging talent that are uh, native in digital or and upskilling your existing uh, your existing teams that needs to raise the bar in terms of technology uh, fluidity. And finally, and that has been true for many many years in terms of development capital projects. How do you get your incentives right? How do you create a game game win win uh, framework? that will foster uh, different constituents uh, in a large uh, development to all roll in the same direction, to, roll, to all contribute and share data, use technology, create scenarios, create optionality, right? And we've, we've seen uh, to, in our research uh, uh, re re relevant uh, benefits in that regard, and some of them are listed here in our slide. So we, we see uh, EPC players uh, gaining a margin. And for those who are in the EPC space, 6, 5.8%, it's, it's relevant, right? And the same for owners, right? Uh, guaranteeing uh, good percentage points in improving uh, your project uh, value over decades, it's a massive amount of money. So uh, that's, that's the approach we've been seeing. And that's the numbers our research has demonstrated. And uh, it, it just continued to be important, particularly in those moments where the cycle is down. Um, on this, when when long-term prices that are used to evaluate projects, they are in a negative, um, negative trend, the value of optionality, the value of stressing scenarios and, and options, engineering options in the beginning on a relative basis, they are much higher because different from price balances where, where, where prices are good and the tide is high, it's much easier to approve, right? And you don't, sometimes you don't need uh, that same amount of effort, but having those scenarios, having that, those stress tests during the low cycle, 
the, the amount of the, the, the return on capital of invested in digital technologies is, is on a relative basis much higher. So key principles that um, that we, we have in our model, uh, it's driven top down, as I mentioned, it has to come to the top. Uh, I, I heard um, a few weeks ago in a results session that from one uh, major minor CEO saying that his company is a technology company, uh, which is very interesting. And, and, and I believe it's true for that company as well. Uh, data has to be shareable, shared, uh, accessible, uh, and transferable, and not only in a particular moment, moment, but throughout the development of that project cycle. And that may, may mean five, 10, 15 years, right? We have projects that I've been commissioned over the last five years that have been sitting in the portfolio of companies for decades, right? And, and, and those decades that they have been somewhat dormant, that, that is the time where you invest low, you shift that chain, amount of change to the left and you iterate and create optionality. So by the time you have the appetite of the company or the investors to develop it, you have a full suite of scenarios and solutions that you can apply. Uh, partnership and shared incentives. We talked a little bit about shared incentives, but the partnership is, is also very important, not only in terms of suppliers working uh, with owners and suppliers among suppliers, but also we see miners um, working with miners, right? Uh, the level of M&A in the industry that is not a big acquisition, but asset-led M&A is really growing much faster than global industry M&A, right? And we've, we've been seeing uh, that, uh, I think the last one was Valid joining Anglo-American in Iron Ore, right? Uh, so having synergies at the, the site uh, level and the asset level is something that's really important um, and diminishes risk. And that's not different in terms of capital project development. Uh, workforce and, and, and level up the workforce for uh, digital adoption and make uh, uh, any worker's life easier and safer is something that uh, it's, it's being applied already across the industry. And finally, uh, the, the, the technology departments have to be in the table, right? I've seen as recent as January, projects that are entering construction phase that doesn't have one line on technology, right? So we still see that. And then later on, it's too late and inefficiencies will play out. So bringing that up front, having the, the projects team, not technology department, but the projects team working in the technology space with the technology groups are, are critical and, and, and brings, as I mentioned before, lots of returns. So that uh, would be all I had to say uh, today, uh, Tommy. Uh, it was really a pleasure. I have here uh, my email. Uh, it would be uh, available for any of you. And I'll uh, also happy to, to, to have a conversation and take some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Aldo, for that um, very insightful um, presentation. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Uh, we do have time for Q&A. And uh, for those audience members that would still like to submit a question, please do. Um, but we did receive some from the audience. So um, let's kick it off with the first question. Um, Aldo, do you think the um, pervasive social risk you mentioned is only about perception and of a societal nature? I suggest poor local community relations are a key factor. Uh, I fully, I fully agree. It's, it's, it's perception, but not only, right? And 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 uh, we heard a lot. Perception is reality, right? I think mining has an intrinsic uh, 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 complexity, which is the societal benefit of mining is dispersed on a geographical basis and also not obvious, right? So sometimes you have a local community who, who see the very uh, obvious and, and acute impacts, negative impacts of a mine development, but the benefits of those, uh, of those, that operation is gonna occur elsewhere, maybe in another country, maybe at the other side of the world, right? So how do you play with that ambiguity, right? 
In terms of biodiversity, I ran uh, environment management for many years. So you have other industries that have as much, sometimes more biodiversity impact than mining, right? Mining sometimes for the amount of revenue you generate and taxes and royalties compared to the size of your put, footprint, compared to some industry like agriculture, agribusiness is not that big, right? But the relationship of the society with that industry is different. The historical links and the, uh, the culture as well is different. So mining has a particular challenge on getting societal acceptance, right? And it's its own responsibility of the mining industry, how to better engage, how to do better. And I mentioned the disasters, right? Um, that's something that's unacceptable. I was uh, in Brazil when the San Marco uh, disaster occurred. And, and, and I was here in Australia when the Brumadinho disaster occurred. And as Brazilian, both are unacceptable for me and as miners as well. So these are the things that shouldn't ever occur. And we have many other examples, right? So I see, I see that uh, perception has to be approached on how better engage, but there are real facts that we need to remove from the mining industry history as well. Tell me. Fantastic. Uh, where does Accenture see the data-driven culture impacting managing um, societal performance effectively? Oh, that's a that's a great question, and I have a very interesting case. I worked with uh, Accenture in Anglo American as a client, <laughs> uh, and uh, I think nowadays is even more powerful. I think nowadays we have the ability to engage uh, and form. Uh, on the social space at scale that we didn't have like 10 or 15 years ago, right? The, the ability to reach out and to get data about all your stakeholder segments is massive, right? And, and miners need to, to drink from that, right? And, and other segment, other industries, they do that much better. For instance, uh, consumer goods, right? They know their client, right? Uh, and why that cannot be used into mining as well. So mining can know much better its stakeholders, can listen to them much, uh, much better and apply that knowledge internally. And, and, and that's, uh, there is a, a very uh, obvious seg uh, segment of the stakeholders that are the own employees or the, the extended value chain employees for any miner. So how to better listen that employee groups uh, and get information so how, and, uh, on how to improve social performance, how to improve any company's social acceptance and then better, relate, uh, uh, better enhance the relationship with those, with those segments and do better to the communities as well. Right. So yes, um, definitely uh, it can be and should be uh, leveraged the digital um, technology. All right, next question. How can the integration of cutting edge technology, such as AI driven project management systems, optimize decision making processes and enhance resource allocation in capital project management? No, thanks. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, I think, as I mentioned before, optionality is a great value for capital development, right? So digital twins, uh, faster database, more accurate data, all of that help creating optionality, right? Help you do much cheaper and faster uh, discussion of scenarios. That being uh, footprint design, site allocation, environmental impact um, assessment, data reading from core samples to water sampling to uh, community relations, uh, hearing, et cetera, right? So there, the, all the project management disciplines can be positively impacted by better data, more digital tools, and, and, and creation of different scenarios. I have seen some examples myself in projects I helped to develop. We create a digital twin of a MagSAP plant where we got data from the OEM on the, uh, the magnetic separator. And we could emulate with the mineral characterization we had a digital team that would create all the distribution of, of uh, recoveries that we would expect uh, once the, 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 the project was on. And that was done on the back of the owners, uh, the OEM data that was done on the uh, bench laboratory uh, test work. 
And then once we started the demo plant, the level of deviation of that data was not that big. And, and, and the deviation we got, we feed that back in the model. So in the next phase in the construction, we would have even a better model to that recovery curve. So, so there are many examples where that, uh, that uh, those tools can be used. All right, great. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, in what ways can strategic alignment between project objectives and technological capabilities uh, mitigate risk and streamline the execution of complex capital projects? Yes. Uh, I think once, once there is a symmetry of information of any partnership in, in any major development, there is risk of value destruction, right? And, and by that, I mean aligning the incentives and putting all the critical components for any particular uh, constituent, it's really important to be done up front um, and really creating an environment of, of collaboration, right? And that asymmetry of information sometimes is not only in the approach of each of those partners, but can be a timing issue, right? Sometimes you, you have some information, but it will take some time until your partner will get the same information. Sometimes you have two sources of true, etc. So Having better data governance, having better information management is something that is critical for any major development. You need to have one single source of truth. You need for a particular discipline, you need to have a one go-to person or one go-to team to refer to as with regards to that particular discipline. There is a very interesting case that we wrote, Accenture was part of that, but it was wrote uh, by our team in Anglo-American along with the IFC, the International Finance Corporation and the Wharton School about that, about how to align incentives and KPIs. I can later share that, Tammy. It's available in the, web, uh, in the website of the Wharton School, which talks exactly about that. How do you align information and you use that uh, better managed information to have all the different partners working together and, and achieving uh, uh, com common goals uh, in the right way. Great, great. Thanks so much, Aldo. All right. Well, I thank think you. that's all the um, time that we have today. I want to give a big thanks to you, Aldo. Thank you so much thank for um, sharing your time with us today um, and offline members. Um, a recording of this um, webinar will be available on our website, um, and nice. everyone will also receive a link um, via email, and it will also be posted on our YouTube channel. So many ways for people to continue to um, um, access this valuable information. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you for everyone who attended today. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and we'll see you at a future off mine event.